to get a concept to take over. And um, if people can't understand it and attach to the idea and the branding, then it doesn't go anywhere, which is exactly. fascinating. fascinating. Okay. Well, why don't I start here and I'll just, we're going to just make this conversational because hey, it's, I think both you and me, we just kind of go for it as you say. Go. All right. So, Dr. Bales, it's great to uh, have you here today. Um, I heard about your noble feeding system a few years ago and actually saw your, your booth there at NAVC probably about two years ago and was aware of your product. Um, he mentioned it to a few people, but kind of um, through the serendipity of life, I think you and I got to know each other a little bit on Facebook and you sent the kit to my daughter for her to use with her cat and which her cat loves. and. Um, and that was great and made more strong recommendations to clients. So as a myself, you know, as I said, I have a, a medical record system that I've devised and even have the patent for the method and, you know, need to, it's an innovative thing to bring out to improve, you know, the um, experience of the animal when they're in care and also even for home care. I want to hear from you your story. Like, how did you come up with this idea and then how did you bring it out into a product and kind of your path to where you are right now where this product is something that is you know also reached out to for um you know the pet owner directly besides as a referral recommendation by the veterinarian so kind of just tell me your story <laughs> so all uh started uh about uh, almost four and a half years ago now uh-huh i was at uh a uh, three-day veterinary conference, and I was on the feline track. Um, I practiced cats and dogs most of my career. I was cat only for five years. Okay. Um, but uh, cat behavior has been my, I just am fascinated by it. Uh -huh. um, I think the, the, the humans and dogs, we, we have some missteps there, but we look at the world very similarly. Um, and cats and humans are really different. Mm -hmm. And see the world and the misunderstandings of the way cats see and interact with the world is the source of so many problems. Yeah. So I have found that I, I didn't get it. You know, when I was a student, I was starting to learn about it from Dr. Overall um, uh -huh. back in the, in the late nineties. And I was like fascinated. It was like the Rosetta stone of <laughs> interaction. And I think communication between people and other people is interesting. And I think communication between people and animals is super interesting. And so I kind of, and my dog's trying to communicate with me right now. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, that uh, I, I got really excited by it. So I've always stayed on the feline track. I've also been fascinated for you cat people out there. I would go to lectures of cat and dog stuff, internal medicine. And then at the end, I would go up to the lecture and say, you know, what's different for cats? I'm like, oh, wait, you can't do any of that for cats. I'm like, well. Yeah, there you were. <laughs> <laughs> that's really changing. And it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, recognizing the cats are a different species than dogs in in we've always said that right to each other but we we you know a cat is not a small dog but but we haven't really differentiated them in medicine until recently in in so many ways so that's really exciting anyway i was at a conference and almost every topic that we talked about for three days had a component of how we feed our cats not what we feed Mm -hmm. how we feed and how that played into so many of the behavioral problems. And okay. Tony Buffington now calls sickness yes. behaviors. Right. Which then become in many cases, medical issues. Right. Um, yeah. And it was this fabulous dynamic lecture that really held my attention for all those days. And she closed the last day by saying to a room full of about 150 cat vets, do you know the number one cause of death for cats? And none of us did. None of us did. Uh, and that's changed too, I think. Uh, uh, but she said the number one cause of death for cats is euthanasia. Right. And the number one cause of euthanasia is being surrendered for a behavior problem. Right. And I'm like, whoa. That, I had never heard that before. And I was totally, it took my breath away. But mm -hmm. we, we, we talk so much about diseases. Yeah. As veterinarians. They're important and we need to know all of them. But we spend so much time on stuff we almost never see. True. Very, yeah. very true. And, I, and believe, mm -hmm. I was going to say, Banfield did, you know, Banfield always does these studies of, and, you know, gathering data from their large, you know, network of hospitals and clients. And I think it was in 2015, they put out of, you know, like kind of the state of the practice or state of what 
owners want from their veterinarian and veterinary provider. And of these five things, only one of them, like the lowest on the list was things like flea and tick control, heartworm prevention, or you know, disease. And the leading things were nutrition and behavior advice. You know? And you know, we, we could talk about that for a long time because I think this is hurting our profession. Absolutely. The, the cat parent now mostly keeps their cat indoors. Mm -hmm. And so they don't necessarily see the value of routine care if we're not addressing their number one and number two concerns. Right. So, so because they don't see the, the veterinary visit as valuable, we're losing the opportunity to catch all of those medical problems before mm -hmm. they become, you know, very serious and, and missing out on that very important relationship. And I think it's a huge opportunity for us to reevaluate our value proposition to the cat parent. Right, exactly, exactly. So I, I walked out of that lecture thinking, wait a minute, we just <laughs> talked about how important all of these behavioral components of feeding are to cats. And I'll go through them really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I went back and looked who that lecturer was now, uh, and it was Dr. Margie Sherrick. And so now she's the oh, yeah. advocate of this way of feeding and, uh, and, and a dear friend. And I like to say, this is all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Margie's great. <laughs> I'm dazzled by her, absolutely dazzled by her. And it is all her fault. If she wasn't such a powerful lecturer, I would never be yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so, and some days that's a good thing and some days not so much. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we know simple facts that I wasn't taught in vet school, but right. cats are solitary hunters. They want to hunt and eat alone. Yeah. That they eat multiple small frequent meals a day. Mm -hmm. uh, their stomach is just about, we know this from anatomy, right? Stomach's not much bigger than a ping pong ball because mm -hmm. the edible contents of a mouse are about the size of a ping pong ball. Nature had that all figured out. So, and then the seeking circuit, they need to hunt, catch, play with their prey, eat, groom, and sleep. And that goes on many times a day. Mm -hmm. The average mouse has somewhere between 30 and 35 calories. Right. And if you're a cat living outside and you're not altered, then you need somewhere around three to 350 calories a day, depending on how active you are. So what that comes out to is cats need to catch and eat something like eight to 12 mice a day. Right. Uh, and that's a stunning number because they're solitary hunters. We don't see them do that. Right. Like, think about the hunt catch play. They're, when they're outside, this is their whole reason for being right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Meal time for a cat is not just getting calories. Mm -hmm. Meal time for a cat is the, the, the predatory behaviors that lead up to getting calories. And what, what uh, you know, some of this is, is presumed and some of this is from like Dr. Buffington's research on puzzle feeders. But when we take that whole experience away from them, it has consequences. It has consequences. And right. what we found now is when we are able to replicate that, even in this relatively rudimentary way, um, the, the problems go away. It's so, right. it's so amazing. Even so, so it's pretty simple. You just take three of these mice. <laughs> it's, super, it's like, duh, uh, three of these mice split the dry food for the day into a morning portion and an evening portion, then take that portion, split it between the three mice and hide them around the house. Mm -hmm. So now, three times during the day and three times overnight, your cat gets to hunt, catch, and play with that small portion. Super simple. Super simple. And what we found, we even did a study of clinic cats mm -hmm. that changing nothing else, they lose weight. Right. I think there's so much more work to be done and I'm really excited for this movement to grow because when, when we take that hunt, catch, play, eat away from them and what what consequences does it have with the endocrine system? What mm -hmm. consequences does that have with the rate of their metabolism? How quickly they digest food? Exactly. The whole phallic phase of digestion is it a, does it play a role in other long term diseases? I'm super interested in it, um, and I think we're going to get there. Um, maybe not in my lifetime, but I think we're gonna, <laughs> I think we're going to get there with answers to those questions. Um, and it's an exciting whole way of thinking about cats, but certainly it plays into their behavior. Absolutely. So in your path here, so how did you, like in your path here, you know, you devised and it sounds like you thought up a way of 
you know, kind of of having that the cats could hunt these little stuffed mice, you know, to be that outlet for the hunting, the outlet for, you know, the prey on them, and then the small, smaller portion feedings, if you will, the smaller feedings throughout the day. So um, tell me a little bit more about how you went from that concept and maybe first design to actually launching this as a product and then kind of the pathway from approaching the veterinary community and then expanding it to the, um, you know, cat owning population. Uh, and you're catching me at an interesting time because we're going to have an announcement, I think, in the next week or two about the next of things. It's super exciting. Um, but I kind of just woke up every day determined. And whatever opportunity I could, um, I could pr make for myself or fall into or relationship I could make to figure out a path, that's what I did. Um, it was really more uh, guerrilla work <laughs> <laughs> which is hey, from a veterinarian, that sounds very good. <laughs> it's necessarily a great thing, uh, but I had no training in business. Yeah. Uh, I never really wanted to have a business. I wanted to help cats and to, to, to start this movement where we pay attention to it. And one thing that I find incredibly frustrating for veterinarians is that we have these ideas, but we have no way of making the change to the cat mm -hmm. and so, so we end up using arts and crafts projects that are not sustainable and frankly not very dignified in the long term to try to create these behavior changes and what happens is they fall apart and the behavior change doesn't happen so my my larger thought was that we need veterinary consensus that we need uh, a way to communicate to uh, the pet parent and then we need a product that is well designed, really well made and easy to understand and use uh, to be able to effectuate that change. Because what I said when we walked out of that lecture hall is what are you guys gonna do when you get home? How are you gonna be different? We mm -hmm. are not, and I still get upset. We are not treating the number one cause of death for our patients. Right, but we don't, that's because we don't, we're not like taught that we are not taught that just even in terms of dog, you know, behavior, 48% of the dogs in shelters are between the ages of six months of age and three years because of all the jumping up and grabbing and mouthing and what we call impulsive behaviors that they did not learn how to control or just basically good manners from puppyhood up because as veterinarians, we have not been just even trained to make that strong advice for say puppy socialization classes. And we should do the same for kitten socialization classes and then know either who to send them to in our community or create them under our roof easily. And that's part of what, you know, I'm working on, I am creating within, you know, the publishing company and so on, but going back to your point, right. What are we going to do tomorrow? So what are we tomorrow and and so the the idea without the tool stays an idea exactly it's yeah a really lucky time in history because it's not just me it's sophia and you and dr buffington and and margie and all the other you know the afp and the work that they're doing and it's it's really sort of a a, a, a special moment in time where everyone is uh, kind of getting the bug that things need to be different. Right. And when, when there's there's power in numbers to make change. One, me sitting mm -hmm. in my room isn't going to cut it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to call out another uh, huge driver for change is women. Yes. I love I love the men in this profession, and and Dr. Carlos Circusa and uh -huh. uh, and Dr. Tony Buffington have been incredibly generous, and so I don't want to ignore the men. They're great. But um, there's a group of veterinary uh, veterinarians who are also moms mm -hmm. on Facebook. Yeah, I've heard of that group. That are now 11,000 and growing. Yeah. We communicate with each other. We support each other. I think we're all so busy in our day-to-day -day lives that there's not that hangout time anymore to, to mm -hmm. grow your network necessarily in, a, in a, a conventional way. And this organic group of women is just really special to help uh, forward whatever we're th from, from how do you manage being a mom and a vet and all the other responsibilities that we have, like day to day stuff, but also professional questions and, and support for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's a cool time to be a veterinarian. On the, we talk a lot about the negatives and they're there. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of positives too. And so I'm grateful to all those people who uh, want to work together for positivity. Right, right. So um, tell me a little bit more about how, you know, you made the product and you were, you know, kind of pitching it, if you will, out to veterinarians to stock in their, you know, clinics and like almost like dispense. And then um, now you've grown it to more on the consumer side. So can you tell me a little bit about how that evolved with, you know, with the product and what are you seeing? You know what I mean? What are you seeing with um, the benefits or how that's going? Yeah. So um, I still think that, uh, and maybe we can work on this together and whoever sure. else wants to on it. I think that veterinarians should have behavior pharmacies. I um, love that. Yes. We need we a I got a, a friend of mine said, Sally, this is the field guide to like behavior medication supplements and diets. I made a handout yeah, yeah. for all the vets in my area when I do behavior consults that when I'm, you know, giving them the report back and saying, why did I choose, say, this med or this supplement or diet? I wanted them to have a quick reference guide as to, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, trazodone does best this way or got to watch out for the side effect that in a very concise way. And my friend said... Awesome. It's like the field guide to behavior yeah, yeah. meds. And especially if this client doesn't do the consult, where should they, you know, what should, how can they have a rationale, right, for deciding, plus what maybe they should stock on their shelf? So and, I agree with you. And, and as it pertains to behavior, I think a lot of those uh, things that we should stock in our pharmacy aren't drugs. Exactly. Right. Drug, we know that drugs have a role and an important one, but, but, for the for the puppy that's pulling, maybe a different collar situation. Exactly right. right. So, yes. And and it's I think one of the reasons also that this has trouble getting traction is because it's a lot. Yeah. It's, it opens up just so many different avenues that are time consuming. So the more that people like you and me can make it bite size mm -hmm. and sort of wait, what's my thing for the thing? I can grab it and still fit yes. that into my whatever fifteen minute half hour appointment. Yeah. With, with simplicity, ease in communication, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's not easy. I'm still, I'm still working on it, but uh, I, again, back to the value proposition of the veterinarian to the cat parent specifically for me, they want nutrition and behavior. Uh, nutrition and behavior. <laughs> you know, I, I, that, that, I love your bling. <laughs> Schools are going to adapt more to this. We have the movements in veterinary medicine that are taking a bigger look at this because it, in a vacuum, what's happening is that very well-meaning people who lack scientific training and have various different motives. Some of them, I've met so many amazing lay people in this space who want to really do what's right for cats, but we should have a role. Yes. Veterinarians should have a role in being advisors to making good, healthy choices in lifestyle. And mm -hmm. since, since we sort of stepped out of that role, because selling things makes us uncomfortable. We're not trained in that. Yeah. So what's happened is that uh, a, a lack of scientific knowledge and a lack of uh, veterinary-based research and advocacy has led to, to a lot of problems and mistakes. And we, we talk about that to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we, we don't really like the whole commercial thing. It's kind of icky. But, mm -hmm. but in the absence of having a role in there, we don't like the results of that either. So yeah. I, I don't know the answer there. And, and I don't always love every day being in that space. Being a women, woman in business right now is <laughs> super, I got to tell you. Yeah. But what else do we do? What else, I mean, we, for me, uh, I have to keep going. And, right. and if, if my, my uh, ideas just stay ideas or they stay a product that sits in a storehouse, um, what good is it? So I, I'm sure I'm making lots of missteps, but I'm trying in every way that I can to be able to get the product and the information to the veterinarians, to the technicians, to the behaviorists, and to the end user, however I can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's more like, just throwing mice against the wall and hoping some of them don't come back <laughs> but because I don't, I, I wish I was better strategically. Um, 
but I, I'm just tr keep trying and seeing what works and what doesn't modify that. Well, I think that's what's really important about, you know, having these like friendships and collaborative relationships. So like example, you and I got to know each other and I think of you as a friend. You're someone who has helped me to see in a bigger light how the benefit, like how the little mice being hidden around the house is not only good for a oh, weight reduction and their behavior of pouncing, et cetera, but how you created it and how you made it and how it's packaged and designed is very appealing and simple to the cat owner because that is the end user, right? That's the user who needs to be able to pick it up and go, oh, wow, my fluffy will love this. Binks yeah. loves it. I, can, I will do this because it, like you said, even if they bought your package and it sat at home and wasn't used, we're still not getting to where we want to go. And that from a, so also from a different point of view to get more veterinarians to recommend this, to promote this, even if they don't want to carry it, if it's like, well, it's down the street at this pet shop or here's the link to buy it online, but I want to see you have it and that it's important. I think sometimes for that message to come from different places, from different like veterinarians and science, especially. And so as a veterinarian and a behaviorist and, you know, I do, and also I'm very focused on reducing stress in all interactions. I mean, not only in inside the vet clinic, obviously that's where I do a lot of my writing and webinar production, et cetera, um, but also for at home in home care and how we interact at home. And so as someone like you and myself, we collaborate because you and I do, or you do a webinar that's published up through a publishing company. They have, wow, I never thought about this with, you know, nutrition and hunting and so important. And then it helps that vet or, and then we make one maybe for like the public and, then we also bring in, you know, others. That's how we can work together. Yeah. And I think that also too, um, I agree with you. It's uh, being a woman in business, especially like crossing over into the industry side. You know, I had my own practice for 35 years. I recently sold the general practice. I still do behavior consultation a bit. Uh, and that's nice because it keeps me in touch with, you know, regular pe pet owners and clients. And yeah. I love that. But with the professional speaking and the writing and everything else, and then here I am talking to large publishing companies, right, and distributors and some large corporate organizations, they're not all nice and they are not all collaborative. And it's like, oh, baby, you really learn quickly how to very carefully read things like contracts and agreements and see clearly when, you know, something is not fair-sided and how to stick up for yourself. Boy, it's, it's, like, the, it's the, I mean, we, we could talk for a whole nother hour sure. about it is the hardest thing in the world because uh, I've worked with a lot of incredibly talented people on this journey and and their contributions have been amazing um, and uh, I think as uh, I don't know if I, I, I can't speak for all women but I think I was raised that I really want to be liked I yeah. really want to be liked all the time and I really want to make people happy and to be able to progress in business that's not always possible and uh for, for a lot of business people, and maybe a lot of those happen to be men, um, that's fine for them. They get it. That's not right. It's more logic-based there. That's just logical. And, okay, not everybody's going to like you. Okay, big deal. For us, it's like, ah. Oh. Agony. Yeah. Absolute agony. And uh, so there's so many different facets to this journey. Um, and a lot of them really distract from the veterinary stuff, which I is my favorite. I love it. But again, without the relationship side, without the business side, I'm learning about finance or without that side, um, there's no way to grow this into something that can actually be a powerful tool. And, uh, and this, this particular mouse is just the beginning. Uh, <laughs> the I, mouse that started it all, just like Disney. <laughs> starter mouse, right, yes, me and Vicky. Uh, I hope that uh, I'll have uh, a wet feeder, which we've been working on a long time. Oh, yeah. I, I hope to have that available by the holiday and then more uh, more products for cats. My dog really is upset that we're not talking about dogs. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, more products uh, that, that sort of um, help round out the wellness feeding category for cats as, as quickly as possible. Right, right. Well, that would be great. And, you know, I think as you mentioned about um, kind of lacking some of the resources and knowledge and things like business or other things about, um, you know, launching a product and in industry, you know, there are other women like ourselves who 
have been inventors or affiliated with, you know, um, or involved in companies that have product and things needing to have them come to market, that I really think we can build this collaborative uh, collaborative group. And that's kind of like why my foot and friends is the name of my website and my Facebook page, because it's kind of to, it's not all about me. You know what I mean? I don't want whatever I do only to be about what I produce or I wrote. I want to embrace and partner up with even in just to help inform the world, even if it's only at that level of say someone like yourself or Dr. Laura Catena with her handling gloves that are really nice and you do low stress handling with those. That's not a license for, you know, difficult handling and things like Sophia's Treat and Train, you know, that Dr. Yen had invented and is still a strong product on the market, yet there are a lot of copycats out there and things like that. So I think, um, and I, I would say this in my experience with most women in business, because we still have that you know, emotional side of our brain is a part of that, in a, you know, super net highway we have in our brain a little different than, say, men. That even in business, women still, I think, want to find ways that's always helping somebody else out. And that that tends... I would say, I'd add to that, veterinarians are amazing. I think Sarah. that are the most generous, kind giving i i owe a huge debt of gratitude to this entire profession to help this crazy journey that i'm on right. um, wow i mean all i do is pick up a phone and someone is there to to give give me all of their knowledge and help and it's incredible mm -hmm. it's a very a very incredible profession and i i hope to be give back to the same order of magnitude um there we're so lucky. We really attract, and it has its downsides in vulnerability and all that other stuff that we see, but, but we really attract helpers. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do. And, and they tend to be sincere and in the bottom of the heart, they really want to do whatever they can to make this life better, you know, for others. So, um, well, thank you. I really appreciate this time and I look forward to collaborating with you on maybe some, maybe we could work on some ideas for publications on feline nutrition and the whole, you know, hunting, the need for hunting and preying upon food as part of improving behavior, welfare and uh, medical health and make that appealing to both, you know, the veterinary professional as well as for the cat owner to understand it. Because I think when we can bring both everybody all together, then we have a unified, you know, way of doing that. And I think it is definitely possible, especially as, you know, we all come together and kind of share our skills. So I think it's without a doubt, it's the it's the wave of the future. I mean, there's yeah. this expand the bull movement and the, the nexus between behavioral health and, and physical wellness in in veterinary medicine is what's is the wave of the future. Let's not wait uh, until we have a, a, a huge problem. Let's, right. let's start with healthy behavior and, uh, and nutrition and, and build into a healthy life and use it as a tool to problem solve. So I would be so honored to work with you on all of that. And this behavior pharmacy notion uh -huh. and um, simplify it and make it uh, a sort of granimals of <laughs> No, well, right. I, I have a webinar that I've, I've published, you know, up through Cattle Dog Publishing called Behavior Cocktails. And that's exactly the concept of that, where it, it is, um, I, it's, a, it's a webinar presentation on what was my go-to, my, this is for intervention plans, right? That last five minutes of that wellness exam where somebody's called and said, oh my goodness, you know, it was Thanksgiving and the dog was growling at the grandchild and what are we going to do now? Christmas is coming up and it's like, yep. oh my goodness, we can't do a full consult right now, but Christmas is in a week. We've got to have an intervention plan. So this is where I would you know, I explained what I had on my shelf, how each med worked in a very concise way. And then it would be, this is like the medication supplement or drug, just like your, and I'll say it like a storm sangria. We're in thunderstorm season here in Illinois. So it's like, all right, every dog and is going to get an adaptal collar. Every cat, we're going to do feel away around the home. Then depending how upset they get, we may add in like propranolol. Uh, and then maybe diazepam and in the cat's sake, we may put them on gabapentin, you know, because now that's like your, you know, tequila and your margarita, let's put it that way, or your wine and brandy and the sangria, but you need the fruit juice. 
And the yep. first two that makes it really good is we're going to teach him to go to the safe room. Kitty's going to go in his carrier. They're going to go to the bathroom. We're going to play Butterscotch's playlist, which is the music. And I have these handouts with it. Yep. That music is helps them to stay calm. So like you said, it's like this packaged granimal. Yeah. <laughs> these common complaints that are encountered in general practice. You are not trying to become a behaviorist. And we're not going to do a consult because we can't do this in five minutes yet. We don't want it to be worse. Yep. And it gives like, so that's, that's the webinar I developed, but I think expanding that because that's one of my most popular topics, you know, yeah. I present, like I said, like my friend saying, wow, this little handout you gave me is like the field guide to drugs. Yeah. I love that idea and we're going to work on that. <laughs> I can't wait. That's very. Okay. Well, we'll click off the interview now and we'll probably keep talking later. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I love your dog. What's your dog's name? Plankton. What is it? Plankton. Plankton. <laughs> what? Yeah. All right. Hey, Plankton. All right. Well, thanks so much and take care. Thank you.